Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly. Steady progress. Pope Francis is showing continued improvement after last week's surgery. We're in Rome. Speaking out, former President Donald Trump is reacting to his indictment and offering a preview of how he plans to fight back reading the Constitution, why some pro-life lawmakers believe the 14th Amendment could protect the unborn, and the heart of our faith, how the Vatican celebrated the feast of Corpus Christi. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us. Our top story tonight, the Vatican says Pope Francis is making a strong recovery following his three-hour surgery last week. However, as a precaution, doctors asked the Holy Father not to deliver his Sunday address to pilgrims. The medical personnel were concerned that it would be too much of a strain on Pope Francis to deliver his Sunday remarks from the hospital balcony. Overall, he is eating regularly, continues to do his work, and earlier today even took Holy Communion. Joining us now from Rome is Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Andreas, great to be with you today. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how Pope Francis is doing? How is his recovery going? Sure, Tracy. So Pope Francis is recovering well. Over the weekend, the Vatican issued several communiques assuring the public that the operation that he had to undergo last Wednesday and the recovery, both of them are going quite well. Moreover, the Holy Father is coping also well with the effects of the surgery and the full anesthesia he underwent. This was the big concern last week, because two years ago, when he had a surgery also at the same hospital at Gemelli, he said that he had suffered after the full anesthesia. Vatican spokesperson Matteo Bruni confirmed also earlier today that Pope Francis is doing well, he's been working, and he has received phone calls. And one phone call he made himself last week was the one to the mother of the child he baptized during his last stay at Gemelli Clinic in March of this year. The mother wanted to come visit Pope Francis, but because of his health status, she was not allowed access to the Holy Father. As soon as he was able, he called her personally. And Andreas, how are things at the Vatican without Pope Francis? And when is he expected to be released from the hospital? Do we know? Well, with the Pope in the hospital, many things are on hold here at the Vatican. On Saturday, there was a big event taking place in St. Peter's Square with the participation of 30 Nobel Peace Prize winners. And it was so-called Not Alone. It focused on the theme of Francis's encyclical Fratelli Tutti, namely human fraternity. However, without Pope Francis being there, the square felt quite alone. I, I felt a bit sorry for the organizers of this big event. Many did not show up in the end and, that the, spa and the space was quite empty. But this is the reality for many things here in the Vatican. When the Holy Father is absent from events, he was expected to honor with his presence. That is why everyone is asking now when he will return to the Vatican. And so far, we have not heard of any other news regarding the 18th of June, and that is the date until which all appointments were canceled. But it could be longer than that at this point. An important message came from Matteo Bruni again last week when he confirmed that all scheduled apostolic trips are still supposed to take place with the Holy Father present. The World Youth Day in Lisbon will start on the 1st of August and has just opened its accreditations for, for the papal plane. Many journalists are interested in participating. The same is also true of Mongolia, where the Pope is supposed to fly to at the end of August. It's speculated that before the end of the year, Pope Francis might also create new cardinals given the age structure of the college. A possible date for that would be before Christmas, but the more traditional one is now during the summer, at the end of June, where, for example, the Feast of the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul could be a good date for that. And you may remember that last year he created new cardinals at the end of the summer. And Andreas, quickly, before I let you go, as you know, yesterday was a celebration of the Solemnity of Corpus Christi. With the Holy Father gone, was there still a procession with the Eucharist? Well, yes and no. No, because there was no official procession in or from St. Peter's Basilica, but there was a beautiful procession from the German Campus Santo Teutonico within the Vatican walls through the gardens up to the Lourdes Grotto. The Swiss guard carried the baldachin, the canopy, and escorted the Blessed Sacrament with the rector of the Campus Santo and the curial bishop, Joseph Clemens. We participated there as a family, and it was a very touching moment to pray with other faithful in front of the Blessed Sacrament at spots where usually only popes would pray. 
Andreas, thank you so much for that report today. We appreciate it. Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief. Thank you again. Our church leaders here in the United States are responding to the recent decision by the Los Angeles Dodgers to honor a transgender group that mocks Catholics. USCCB notes that on June 16, the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, quote, a professional baseball team has shockingly chosen to honor a group whose lewdness and vulgarity in mocking our Lord, his mother, and consecrated women cannot be overstated. The bishops are calling on Catholics to pray the Litany of the Sacred Heart on June 16, offering this prayer as an act of reparation for the blasphemies against our Lord that we see in our culture today. In the meantime, a so-called Pride Mass in western Pennsylvania has been canceled. The Mass was scheduled for Sunday at Duquesne University. Bishop David Zubik of the Diocese of Pittsburgh said that the church cannot support the secular observance of Pride Month, adding the initiative endorses lifestyle and behavior that the church does not support. In Maine, a group of lawmakers have signed off on a proposal considered to be one of the least restrictive abortion laws in the U.S. It would allow abortions after a baby is considered viable or able to live outside of the womb if deemed necessary by a doctor. Currently, Maine allows abortion up until around 24 weeks of pregnancy. Our former President Donald Trump will face a federal judge tomorrow on charges that he mishandled classified documents. The unprecedented indictment continues to divide the country as the current occupant of the Oval Office undergoes a surprise procedure. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, before we get to former President Donald Trump, President Joe Biden underwent a root canal today. We're told he was having some pain in one of his teeth on Sunday. That's when they started the procedure. Today they finished that root canal, and that, of course, impacted his entire schedule for today. And the White House press secretary went before reporters this afternoon to update them on the president's dental health. This is something that Americans just across the country, uh, it is go through. Uh, many of them do, and it's routine, and he is fine. Meanwhile, officers surround the federal courthouse in Miami, where former President Donald Trump is expected to appear tomorrow. He could face a lengthy prison sentence if he's convicted of mishandling classified documents and obstructing justice. The ridiculous and baseless indictment of me by the Biden administration's weaponized Department of Injustice will go down as among the most horrific abuses of power in the history of our country. The former president is also planning a speech tomorrow night, and he says there are no circumstances under which he would leave the 2024 race. Asa Hutchinson and Vivek Ramaswamy, two of several candidates challenging former President Trump for the Republican nomination, have different takes on the indictment. It's obviously a very solid indictment. Uh, the grand jury found probable cause for it that I personally have no faith whatsoever in those vague allegations. So if those are true, yes, I think that's reflective of very bad judgment. I'm skeptical that it even is true. But the bottom line is we cannot conflate a bad judgment with a violation of the law. And at the White House, a rally for college athletes on the South Lawn. President Biden had to miss the event due to his tooth procedure. So instead, Vice President Kamala Harris delivered remarks. You are leaders. You are role models. And, of course, you are champions. Also, President Biden was supposed to welcome to the White House outgoing NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg today, but the root canal put that on ice. Instead, they'll meet again tomorrow. And we're told the president was not put under anesthesia, so the 25th Amendment was not invoked. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, joining us now is Christopher Bedford, executive editor of Common Sense Society. Chris, great to see you as always. A lot to get to today, but first, uh, let's talk about former President Trump's federal indictment. I want to get your thoughts on that and where you see this all going. Oh, it's, it's, it's hard to see where it's all going, but I think Alan Dershowitz, the famous former Clinton lawyer, had a good take on this, where he said the prosecutors had really one mission here. It wasn't necessarily to enforce the law. It was to get Donald Trump. Now, but that doesn't mean that Trump's not in trouble here. There's video, re there's, there's audio recordings of him bragging about some of this stuff. Uh, for example, there's a lot of evidence that's been put forward. Bill Barr, his former attorney general, says that he thinks that Donald Trump's in a lot of trouble. But there's a lot, there's a lot to be said for, the, for Trump's defense right now. It's going to rest on two different pillars. One, that this is 
basically a speeding ticket. This is not a felony. That the, the, There's no reason for them to be going after him in such a way. Dershowitz agrees with that. And two, that the Department of Justice was unethical in his pursuit, whether it's threats against the, threats against the lawyer representing uh, his, his uh, representing uh, Donald Trump's co-defendant, essentially, in this case, or whether it was the way that they raided Mar-a-Lago and how they went after him and compared that to Mike Pence, for example, or Hillary Clinton, or even Joe Biden's mishandled this information. And then finally, was this information actually used to endanger the security of the United States? Was it used in espionage? Or was it used maybe in conversation and bragging around Mar-a-Lago? That's going to make a big difference in this. Uh, on a different note, over the weekend, a number of Pride events took place in Washington, D.C., including at the White House. But it was a post that President Biden tweeted out yesterday uh, that seemed to ruffle a lot of feathers. It was a picture of the Pride flag hanging from the White House and saying, quote, Today, the people's house, your house, sends a clear message to the country and to the world, America is a nation of pride. Chris, I want to get your reaction to that and, and why you think this particular tweet garnered so much negative attention. Because it broke basic U.S. flag code, uh, and, and, and it dishonored the country. To put a, it's against the, the code, essentially, which our government enforces, to put a flag central or above the United States flag. And the White House, the center of our government, did that with an ideological movement to say that this was central to American identity. Usually, nations only get their flags replaced when they lose a war and are conquered. And I think that's what a lot of people feel like, whether it's through the removal of statues, the fact that the pride flag is put above the American flag. And Byron York had a really good column uh, earlier today in the Washington Examiner. He pointed out, compare the D-Day pronouncement by President Joe Biden. Compare the Memorial Day announcement by President Joe Biden. These used a combination of bravery and courage three times in both pronouncements combined. That was blown out of the water by Joe Biden's pronouncement at the Pride, at the Pride celebration at the White House. And it, it just shows that what's actually central to this administration and what doesn't really matter that much. In the meantime, in Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, last week, a group of Muslim parents and parental and religious freedom rights advocates held a protest because the school district no longer is allowing parents to opt out uh, their children out of classes that deal with family life and human sexuality, including subjects like transgenderism and homosexuality. What's more, even some of the Muslim students uh, spoke out against the coursework themselves at a school board meeting. Chris, what more do you know about this? And I know the state of Maryland actually allows parents to opt out. So why is Montgomery County, why are they doing things differently here? Montgomery County is radical. A lot of the teachers' unions have been radical. A lot of that was exposed during COVID. It's been exposed since parents during homeschooling have gotten involved and seen what their children are actually reading. I remember a rally just a few years, like three years ago in Montgomery County where one teacher said that they were willing to put their bodies into the gears of the capitalist machine to grind it to a halt. That's what they were trying to do, not really keeping clothes for COVID. Uh, but doing that. And that's what they're doing with a lot of this sexual agenda. It's not about canceling people or ignoring different people's lived experiences. It's about indoctrinating children. Now, a small group of really active active people are able to push this through in a lot of places. Well, Montgomery County is not very not conservative at all. Even in conservative counties, that sort of thing happens because of a vocal minority. So it's good to see parents out there who say, we're willing to be a vocal minority too, or a vocal majority. We're willing to get involved because it, it, it's not just opinion polls that are going to change this country. It's parents getting involved and saying, no, absolutely not. You won't do this to our kids. Chris, we have about 30 seconds left or so, but curious what else you're following. I'm following that main abortion law you talked about. 24 weeks was previously the abortion law. And earlier this spring, Derek Hall was, was drafted onto the Seahawks football team. He was six foot three and 256 pounds. He was born at 23 weeks. So now when abortion advocates are trying to push for a bigger expansion past viability, they're killing people. The science is against them, and he is a really shining example of a brave mother and a brave young man and what you can accomplish despite what a lot of these naysayers claim. Absolutely, Chris. Thanks for bringing up that point. We appreciate and always appreciate your insights. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including Fight for the Unborn. A pair of lawmakers are using the Constitution to aid the pro-life movement. And Pope Francis honors the former Prime Minister of Italy.
Well, the Archdiocese of St. Louis in Missouri is set to pay a $1 million sexual abuse settlement. The claims are from a man sexually abused by a priest. The same priest spent 12 years in prison for abusing a different victim. The Archdiocese expressed its sympathy, adding it continues to pray for all victims of clergy misconduct. A former longtime prime minister of Italy has died. Silvio Berlusconi was the country's longest serving head of government. The billionaire ad media magnet began as Italy's leader back in the 1990s. He led a scandal plague career despite being reelected several times. Pope Francis sent a condolence telegram to the former prime minister's family. Berlusconi was 86 years old. On new details tonight regarding the gruesome stabbings of children last week in France. A prosecutor says judges handed down preliminary charges of attempted murder against a 31-year-old Syrian refugee. More also is known about the man who is credited with thwarting the attack before it got any worse. Reports say a 24-year-old Catholic pilgrim chased away the suspect from the playground. He says that he just acted on instinct and is being hailed as a hero. Four children remain in the hospital. Their injuries are not considered life-threatening. Well, the health service in England says that it will not give puberty blockers to children at so-called gender identity clinics. The publicly funded National Health Service says more research needs to be done about the drugs. The NHS says parents and children can still try to obtain puberty blockers elsewhere, but doing so is, quote, strongly discouraged. Well, it has been almost a year since the U.S. Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade, and pro-lifers continue fighting for the unborn. A pair of Republican lawmakers are pushing a resolution acknowledging unborn babies have a right to life, and they're using a constitutional amendment to do it. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Good evening, Tracy. You know, just after the Civil War in the 1860s, Congress passed the 14th Amendment, giving slaves the right to life and liberty. Now, Congressman Doug Lamborn tells me that he's sponsoring a new resolution using the 14th Amendment to cover any child living in the womb. The 14th Amendment was originally intended and should be interpreted now as protecting everyone's right to life, and that includes the unborn. Arizona Congresswoman Debbie Lesko, a co-sponsor, said in a statement, quote, the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution guarantees equal protection under the law and ensures that no one is unjustly deprived of their fundamental rights to life and liberty. Both say the resolution is consistent with the U.S. Supreme Court's Dobbs decision. But even some pro-life advocates argue against relying only on the 14th Amendment to protect the unborn. I think it would behoove pro-lifers to respect its original intent and perhaps use other means to fight for the protection of the unborn that will ultimately hold up long term and hold up much better than using the 14th Amendment as a bludgeon. Still, Congressman Lamborn tells me people need to think about others instead of just themselves. There are people who are so intent on protecting the mother's autonomy to her body and her life, they don't they're not willing to recognize that the child within them is a different, a separate, another life. And what about the 2024 presidential election? Pro-lifers tell me that they will only back a nominee who supports federal minimum protections for the unborn. We're very focused on, you know, a presidential nominee who would support a gestational limit at 15 weeks at most when an unborn child can feel pain. By the way, this resolution isn't intended to become law. It's meant to be used as a guide to protect the unborn from all three branches of government and to raise awareness about the issue. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, a new low. We learn more about the declining birth rate in the U.S. and what it can mean for future generations. Plus, the Vatican hosts an event celebrating unity. Well, the birth rate in the United States has fallen to its lowest level in more than a century. According to a recent report from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, around 3.6 million babies were born last year. That is down from 3.75 million in 2019. In 2007, the birth rate was much higher, around 4.3 million. When Atlas says the study points to a worrying future 
for the country. We go now to Roger Severino, Vice President of Domestic Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Roger, great to have you back on. Um, let's talk about these low birth rate numbers and what they say to you. How concerning is it? Well, Elon Musk said the greatest threat to our civilization is not AI, it's not climate change, it is demographic collapse. And we're at the precipice. We're at 1.6 in terms of total fertility. We need to be at 2.1 or above to replace ourselves. And we're not doing that. And it's a crisis. It's a slow moving crisis that no industrialized country has been able to really solve. Uh, Hungary has been one that has dedicated tremendous resources to increase the birth rate. But everywhere else in the West, we're seeing this decline. And I think it is symptomatic of a loss of hope. We are losing so much hope. It's a, a society in many ways of a culture of despair. And if you live in a culture of despair, then you don't have hope in the future and you don't get married and have children. And at the Heritage Foundation, we're doing everything we can to come up with innovative policy solutions to reverse this trend, to restore America. And the West is this beacon of hope, of vibrancy, of dynamism. And that includes family, marriage and reproducing, frankly. Yeah, and Roger, I know you recently said uh, America faces no greater long-term threat to its economic, military, and cultural well-being than these low birth rates. Uh, talk to us more about that. Well, here's a sobering statistic. In three out of four American counties, there are more recorded deaths than births. That, by definition, is unsustainable. We have to have something worth passing on, and we have this genius of the American experiment that is at the risk of literally disappearing a few generations from now um, because we have first a decline in marriage and a decline in, in, in birth. And that stems from a lot of terribly misguided policies going back from the great society that replaced the married family unit with Uncle Sam as a provider. And we've discovered that Uncle Sam is more like an absentee father. He, he should not be a replacement to a married mom and dad raising kids. So we've seen the marriage rate decline from about 76% in 1970 to around 31% now. And people are delaying marriage, not getting married, delaying births. Whereas before, we used to have marriage and child rearing as the cornerstone of a life. That was the American dream. You start there. Now it's been seen as some, some sort of luxury good that is a capstone once you get everything else out of the way. And that's backwards. And we got to get government out of the way to make sure they're not penalizing marriage anymore and restore this culture of vibrancy and hope in the future. And it begins with marriage and kids. Yeah, and Roger, I was going to ask you, I mean, what do you think can be done to reverse these trends and sort of this mindset and also better promote families and, and, and help to support them? Sure. We're looking at innovative things like child and family tax credits, uh, making sure we have more options for uh, working mothers, for mothers who stay at home, educational choice, uh, removing as many barriers as possible to things like work requirements in a welfare state. Often we have this thing where government has been the provider, where we've seen in previous administrations and the current one, where they see the government as the solution, that we're going we're gonna to have you be the father. No, government is half the problem. Now, we should look into solutions where government incentivizes marriage and family formation. But right now, we're in the position where government is penalizing it and saying, you're better off if you don't get married, if you don't have kids, because we're going to give you some benefits or give you tax uh, penalties if you do get married. Those have to stop. And once that, that is pushed out of the way, we got to look at innovative policy solutions to incentivize marriage, like countries like Hungary have implemented. They put their money where their mouth is, and they've been one of the few to actually reverse their declining birth rate. And Roger, do you think that this will happen here in the US? I mean, do you think they'll put some of these policies in place in the federal government? We're hopeful. It depends if there's a change in administration, whether they will be open to these policies. But you have to value family and children in the most traditional sense, because we know that's the one that works the best. And we've moved so far away from that as a culture that we need a lot of rebuilding to do culturally to say we have to value the married mother and father and their kids in the home, because we know that's what leads to the best of human flourishing, the safest place in the womb is in the womb of a married mother. And the most dangerous place is in the womb of a single unmarried mother. So if we address the marriage rate, we're also going to address the abortion rate. And again, this is about restoring hope to the nation because there's something about the American experience that is worth passing on for future generations. So we got to restore the, the confidence in the American dream and make sure our government policies align. 
And with a new administration, I'm hopeful we could achieve that. Roger, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about all of this. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, finally tonight, as we mentioned earlier, Pope Francis delivered a message to a distinguished group at the Vatican over the weekend. In it, he reminded the faithful to treat people with dignity and respect and not as objects. The Holy Father's message was read by Cardinal Mauro Gambetti. The event on human fraternity was sponsored by the Fratelli Tutti Foundation. The Holy Father emphasized seeing others as people and not numbers. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.